Hello and welcome to this event on handset affordability. It's great to see so many of you joining us today from around the world. My name is Isabel Carboni. I'm the Insights Director for Digital Inclusion. At a time when being connected is so crucial, yet economic hardships are biting, we're taking this opportunity to share with you some of the innovative strategies from existing solutions to making internet-enabled handsets more affordable, especially for those who are least likely to own one. We have some exciting expert speakers lined up for you today to share their insights on these issues. And first of all, I'd like to introduce Max Cuvier, our Head of Mobile for Development at GSMA, to share a few words. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much, um, Isabel, for having me and welcome everyone to, to this session. Um, First of all, I would like to acknowledge our partners, FCDU and CEDA, thanks to whom we're able to produce uh, a lot of the content you'll be hearing about today um, and so much more, actually. So today we're talking about mobile internet. It has transformed our lives. And if you're joining us today, there's a really high chance that you're like me and you're absolutely like amazed by how many opportunities mobile internet can translate into. However, it's not yet a reality for everyone uh, at all, actually. 6% of the world's population are yet to be covered by mobile broadband, which means 94% of the world's population is already covered by mobile broadband. That said, more shockingly, 43% of the world's population lives within footprint of a mobile broadband network, but is not using mobile internet. And these are the more than 3 billion people that we'll be focusing on today. Some populations are particularly excluded when it comes to mobile internet usage. And across low and middle income countries, people in living in rural areas, for instance, are 37% less likely to use mobile internet than those who are living in urban areas. Women are also 16% less likely than men to use mobile internet, a gap that's actually grown in 2021 after years of very hard gains. Though it may sound obvious, you can't get online without an internet enabled device. But those are still unaffordable for too many people. In fact, the affordability of handsets remains one of the key barriers that stop people from using the mobile internet. And just like mobile internet usage, smartphone ownership remains unequal. For example, women are 18% less likely to own a smartphone than men. And worryingly, the latest data from a mobile gender gap report shows that after years of progress, just, for, just like for the mobile internet gap, the gender gap in smartphone ownership has widened slightly in 2021. As Isabel was saying, the pandemic and its resulting economic fallout have caused household incomes to drop. And while the global economy is starting to recover, arguably, incomes for the poorest households have not recovered yet. So with income inequalities widening, uh, the inflation going up, and disruptions in the supply chain that are pushing hence its costs up, it is essential that we work together, that we join forces to develop solutions that improve the affordability of handsets if we want to achieve our mission of closing the usage gap. For those with limited income and saving, access to affordable handsets, but also to affordable finance, will be a necessary condition to digital inclusion. Of course, Fixing handset affordability won't solve the problem on its own. It is compounded by other issues such as social norms or awareness or digital skills, but it is a key piece of the puzzle. So I'm very proud of what the mobile industry and many others, including those speaking today, are already doing to contribute to solving this issue. Handset affordability is on more and more people's agenda, and I'm excited to see so many new initiatives. So the team has put together a very ambitious agenda for you today, and I hope that this session will inspire all of you to collaborate and to innovate, to improve access to handsets for all, and to develop the solutions, the program, but also the policy that will ensure that no one is left behind in the digital world. Thank you and enjoy the session. Thank you, Max, for kicking us off today. Our team recently published a report on making internet-enabled handsets more affordable. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Anne Delaporte, our Senior Insights Manager and author of that report. 
to take us through the highlights. Please do feel free to ask any questions in the chat. And over to you, Anne. Thank you, Isabel. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm very pleased to now present you some of the key highlights of the report we published recently. Next slide, please. So this report builds on our 2017 one that identified models and approaches to provide affordable smartphones for people in um, low-income communities. And a lot has happened in the last five years to make internet-enabled handsets more affordable and accessible to underserved population. And really, that's the key focus of the report, is what happens the last five years. The report is framed around three levers that I will give you an overview of today. Reducing cost of handsets, making handset financing more accessible and strengthening the enabling environment. Of course, I won't have time to talk about everything and I encourage you to have a look at the report that also provides many considerations when developing approaches for improving affordability. Next slide. So what is the problem? So as Max just mentioned, globally 3.4 billion people live in areas with mobile 3G or 4G coverage, but are not using mobile internet. And most of these unconnected live in low and middle income countries. And again, like as Max said, affordability of handset is a key barrier to mobile ownership and also to mobile internet use for those who are aware of it, particularly for women and rural population. Next slide. So before I jump into the different levers, I wanted to um, talk about the affordability and what we mean by affordability. Affordability is a bit is more subjective and it's more it's often taken into the context of availability of ready cash. However, the affordability barrier is more than just the cost of a handset in relation to income. In addition to um, income factors, other non-economic factors such as taste or perceived quality and so on have a strong influence on handset purchase decisions. And it's important to not only consider the cost of a handset in relation to a person's ability to pay, but also to consider the cost of a handset in relation to a person's needs, preferences, and perceived value to their life, what we call the willingness to pay. Next slide. So we've identified four key approaches to reduce the cost of handset, making it cheaper for underserved groups. And these approaches have either disrupted the market or have potential to do so. The first approach is developing intermediate handsets running on lightweight operation system. Thanks to this, the cost of a 4G handset is now closer to that of a 2G handset. And it enables first mobile internet experience with attributes that make it attractive to certain underserved groups. So for example, smart feature phone or more robust have a long battery life I won't go into the details, but I, um, I, the panel will probably talk about that after this presentation. Um, customizing smartphones for a specific market or region by optimizing on cost component is another way to reducing cost and also increasing value at the same time. And this can be done by either leaving out high-end features or features that or bring on the specific um, features that markets or customers segment like and are willing to pay for and are relatively cheap to provide. Reducing procurement, distribution, and marketing costs is a, or in other words, um, changing the resource configuration helps decreasing the cost structure and getting lower priced handset to customers that are more price sensitive or price conscious. And partnership here can play a big role by addressing at the same time, not only the affordability barrier, but also awareness and access to handsets. For example, we know that in rural areas, the price of, the hand of a handset can be much higher than in, in larger urban centers. And this is due to high transportation costs, high logistical costs, but also commissions that are taken by intermediaries. So partnership, partnering with organizations that have strong rural distribution network, for example, can help address this issue. Last but not least, handset refurbishment has a potential to disrupt the market in low and middle income countries. So you're probably more familiar with second hand phones, although second hand phones are not regulated and they don't guarantee the quality of a phone. In contrast, 
refurbish for our customers a discount on pre-owned handset and our, and our quality assured. So that's the difference between second hand and a refurbished handset. So this model of refurbishment is quite mature in high income countries, but it's just emerging in one million income countries, especially in South Asia. And it will be interesting to see how this evolves and look at the trends in the coming years. Next slide. So we talked about how to reduce the cost of a handset. Another lever is to facilitate payment for handsets that have different price ranges. And we've identified several innovative, innovative ways to democratize access to handset with financing that make them more available and accessible to underserved customers. So first, the use of inclusive data for credit assessment is becoming quite popular to extend financing for the underbanked. And more and more data is becoming available and various stakeholders have started to use what we call non-conventional data for credit scoring. However, when developing this type of assessment, it's important to be aware of data privacy and gender bias. Um, indeed, we know that some algorithms used for credit assessment are biased. For, for example, when you think about the threshold established for scoring, that don't necessarily always reflect the consumption patterns of women versus men. And it's also important to think about who is eligible for credit, because many underserved customers have not generated enough digital data to be credit scored and lack the collateral to secure a loan. So talking about collateralization now, mobile phone locking technology is becoming mainstream. And with this technology, a phone paid for in installments can be used as a collateral. And financing can therefore be extended to almost everyone, including those customers who cannot use credit score to a lack of data. And the technology is con continuously evolving, as well as the level of restrictions that are applied when a customer hasn't made a payment on time. Um, from an ethical standpoint, it is important for customers to still be able to access essential functions on their phones, such as receiving and making calls. And in some countries, this is actually a regulatory requirement. Important thing to consider when, when developing locking mechanisms. Finally, mobile operators and other stakeholders have also been testing different payment modalities that allow for flexible payment terms and make handsets more affordable to those who have more irregular income. So thinking, for example, about farmers who have seasonal income patterns or daily workers. So we've seen many interesting examples from operators, from solar company and other actors in the ecosystem that are putting in place options to allow customers to repay, either when they have money available or to extend their payment repayment period or even postponing or preponing um, a certain uh, payment. So perhaps starting stating the obvious here, but it's important when developing solution to make handset financing more accessible to also protect customers, to communicate the value proposition and terms and conditions, and doing that in a, in a way that is understandable by people who are less digital literate knowing that digital literacy is also a barrier to mobile internet use that is important to address. Next slide, please. Finally, strengthening the enabling environment is also key to improving affordability. And government can contribute to make handsets more affordable. So in our report, we developed eight policy considerations to improve handset ownership around three key themes. So first, policymakers should develop policies that lower the cost of a handset, such as reducing specific taxes and fees, or, for example, also putting in place handset subsidies programs. They should also expand options for individuals to finance a device by enabling responsible development of alternative credit scores or de-risk financing. And finally, they should indirectly improve affordability by stimulating demand and tackle the trade of stolen, fraudulent, and counterfeit devices. Next slide, please. 
So what our research found as well is that there is no one size fits all solution. And implementers should be mindful of the context in which they operate and who they aim to reach. Depending on the country or region, some solution may be easier to implement than others. For example, when we think about Sub-Saharan Africa that have a thriving mobile ecosystem, it makes it easier to offer handset finance. In other countries, regulations such as high taxes on imported handsets and laws forbidding, for, forbidding the, the device locking um, in it also like prevent innovation and, and new solution to, to improve affordability. To conclude, I would say that we've seen in this presentation many innovative approaches to improve handset affordability that fall under three levers. And that reflects the complex nature of the handset affordability problem. Um, from our the interview we did with our stakeholders, we found that the price of handsets is not expected to decrease much further. And it's more likely that process innovation and improvement to the technology presented will continue. But one approach or business model may not only address part of the problem. And, and really to, to put in place holistic measures, stakeholders should consider to implement a set of approaches that address multiple levers by increasing even more collaboration. And it can take a lot of time and it can take a lot of resource to get the model right with the right partners, but it can really have a significant positive impact. Next slide. So you will find plenty of consideration to make handsets available and affordable in our report as well as uh, we've published recently a new case study on the MCOPA pay as you go model for smartphone in Africa. Obviously, if you want to get in touch, please do. Thank you very much for listening, and um, I hope you enjoy the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for sharing those highlights on how to make handsets uh, less expensive, increase access to financing, and also the policy levers that can help make a difference in making handsets more affordable. Unfortunately, the minister is unavailable to join us, so we're going to move straight to the panel discussion now. So it's my pleasure to hand over to our head of program, Claire Sibthorpe, to moderate today's panel. Great. Uh, thanks, Isabel, and it's a, it's a pleasure to, um, to welcome Sebastian Coteville from KaiOS Technologies and Davide Tachino from Vodacom, who are both have deep expertise in this area and lots of experience to share. So I'm really, really delighted to have you both here and that you can give your time. Um, really looking forward to hearing your views. Um, you have so much experience in this space. Um, I'm just going to kick right off and um, I'm going to ask you both each the same question. Maybe uh, Sebastian, you could answer first. Um, We've just heard in the presentation that Anne talked about three broad strategies or levers for that are being used to drive handset affordability. And I was wondering, in your opinion, with you know both your deep expertise, you know where do you see is the biggest opportunity for making handsets more affordable? Basically, I'm asking you know where where do you think we could focus focus should focus our efforts if we're going to tackle this problem? So maybe Sebastian, over to you first. Thanks, thanks, Claire. Um, well, maybe uh, I'll start with a, uh, a bit of analysis on who are the customer we are targeting, and um, I'll talk about disposable uh, and, and daily income uh, to start with. And from the study we've we've done uh, at KOS, actually, we, we are targeting users who have a daily income between two and ten dollars. Um, and if you look at this uh, this population, which is uh, mostly on two G or not using a phone. Uh, if we want to, to really drastically reduce the usage gap, we actually need to combine the three measures uh, presented uh, just, just before in the, in the report. Uh, so it's important uh, to get cheaper devices, to get more affordable devices. Uh, it's important to get financing solution, and it's also important to get a strong policy drive actually to, to for example, decrease uh, import taxes, uh, decrease the different form of taxes, but also get more content and more useful content onto uh, the devices. So le let me maybe um, explain why um, we believe that uh, uh, devices below the smartphone space also can help. And uh, as you probably know, KOS is a solution for smart feature phone. 
so uh, phone below the smartphone space with internet capability. Um, if you if you look at today the cost of smartphones, um, if you want to go with a 4G smartphone, you need to uh, probably get a product around 45, 50 dollars out of the factory, which once it gets into the country, it's costing probably around 60 to 70 dollars uh, in retail. Um, if you put a financing scheme onto that, then you will en end up with something like 15 dollars upfront or low upfront cost. And then on a monthly basis, probably around five dollars. And if you look at the two to ten dollars uh, daily disposable income uh, population we are targeting, um, and uh, if you take uh, the hypothesis of the two uh, two percent of the monthly income as a telecom bill, monthly telecom bill, uh, it means that these people can pay between one and six dollars of monthly bill. If the repayment of the installment on the uh, on the smartphone cost them five dollars already, it means this is not affordable for most of this population between two and ten dollars. So what what we want to do and uh, uh, what uh, what we believe we we should do is to uh, one to get. Um, lower cost device, probably around $20 uh, device uh, with internet capability, with internet connection, with applications available on it, with financing, with some form of financing. It can be financing, uh, classical financing or some mode of subsidies, which allow to price the product at the price close to 2G. So it does not create a gap for people to, to acquire the product and with a monthly uh, repayment, uh, including, um, let's say, the repayment of the financing and the telecom bill uh, below, $10, uh, below $2 per month. And th this is really where we believe we should be. And um, uh, so acting on the policies, acting, acting on the import tax, uh, acting on uh, uh, creating a, a affordable data plan, and, uh, and also putting in place subsidies or financing me method is probably the way, the combined way to, to achieve that. Thanks a lot. It's great to hear that you think with combining these levers, we can actually succeed. That's great. Um, and David, I'd like to ask you the same question. So where, you know, where do you see is the opportunity and, and where would you focus efforts? Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, thank you, Claire. So um, to be honest, uh, I see uh, I see limited opportunities uh, on uh, the supply side of the value chain as uh, uh, a lot of work uh, has been done uh, on cost optimization in, uh, in the past. Um, as an example, uh, uh, Vodafone sold more than 100 million uh, Vodafone branded devices worldwide with the purpose of democratizing uh, 3G and 4G trends uh, for the low uh, and, uh, and the mid uh, uh, income uh, uh, segments. Uh, the whole production chain was optimized to achieve high quality affordable devices and these uh, drove down uh, the industry cost uh, as well. Uh, to, to move uh, uh, towards uh, greater opportunities, uh, in some markets uh, subsidized schemes uh, are, uh, are still very successful. Uh, operators uh, subsidize devices to reduce the street prices uh, and create elasticity and, and at the end, uh, uh, more sales uh, and more connections. Unset financing schemes uh, are a successful reality in some markets uh, and can achieve, uh, um, in my opinion, uh, a wider scale and, uh, and also a better value. Um, they are quite complex in terms of economics. Uh, uh, as an example, let's think about the impacts on cash flows and potentially on bad debt. Uh, and they are also quite complex in terms of platforms and technology behind to assess uh, customers' credit profile uh, and lock the phones uh, in case of issues. Um, but they can really uh, move the needle uh, and reduce uh, the, the cost to connect. Uh, as an example, Safaricom, uh, which is part of a Vodacom Group, uh, uh, has been uh, extremely successful on uh, on unset financing uh, in Kenya. In the past year, we sold there more than half a million 4G smartphones, uh, thanks uh, to uh, thanks to financed uh, uh, schemes. Another opportunity sits on the regulatory and government side uh, in terms of taxes, duties, uh, and in general regulations, uh, which at the end uh, make uh, connected devices uh, less affordable. 
um, multilaterals uh, could also cooperate uh, and help a lot uh, on, on that. Uh, finally, um, Africa is uh, probably the biggest market in the world for uh, pre-owned phones. Nevertheless, uh, such phones are usually locally repaired by the informal sector and therefore low quality and mainly 2G and 3G. Um, what is missing uh, is the flow of good uh, quality pre-owned 4G devices from uh, uh, the developed countries to the developing countries. Within the United Nations uh, uh, Broadband Commission work stream on device affordability and together with the ITU, uh, we are working on that. Uh, we have also just launched in South Africa uh, our uh, Vodacom uh, Goodes new pre-owned handset offer and uh, uh, sales uh, are, are promising. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That's very interesting to hear about all the different things that you're doing um, across the range of, of areas and your perspective also on where we, you think we've optimized things. Um, maybe I'll stick with you, Davide, on, uh, for the sort of a follow-up question. You know, we heard both from Max and Anne that handset affordability is disproportionately impacting specific segments, particularly women, particularly those in rural area. So at Vodafone, you know, who, who, are, who are you prioritizing in your efforts and, and how is that kind of thinking about those segments impacting on some of that strategy? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for, uh, for, for the question. Uh, uh, it's a quite interesting one. Uh, in, in Vodacom, uh, uh, we implement uh, a segmented marketing strategy. Uh, which includes devices, but obviously goes uh, beyond uh, the hardware offers uh, and uh, embraces uh, services and platforms uh, for, uh, for our customers. We have a specific strategy to target and satisfy the needs uh, of the disadvantaged communities uh, and uh, underserved segments uh, and specific uh, teams uh, and product services uh, to address, uh, um, to address uh, such, uh, such needs. Uh, in terms of devices, uh, we have a portfolio of very good quality, no frills uh, products uh, and suppliers uh, which address uh, the low income segment. I mentioned before uh, the Vodacom branded devices uh, produced precisely to democratize trends. KaiOS uh, smart feature phones uh, and Android Go smartphones uh, are other examples of customized products uh, for such a segment. Uh, on, top, uh, um, on top of that, uh, we have partnerships uh, with the biggest manufacturers of African markets, like uh, uh, Transion Group, uh, as an example, as well as uh, with the over-the-tops. Uh, in terms of distribution, uh, uh, our objective is reaching the whole population with our offers and services. Uh, in South Africa, Lesotho and Mozambique, as an example, uh, we rely on our stores uh, and department store chains, uh, uh, stores uh, which are accessible from rural areas. In other markets like Kenya, uh, uh, as an example, uh, to address the rural communities, uh, we also count uh, on a very wide network of street soldiers uh, as well as uh, on our partners, like, as an example, Encopa, uh, specialized uh, in the informal sector uh, uh, distribution. And finally, in terms of services, uh, the Vodacom Connect You platform offers uh, a range of uh, propositions for free, including education, jobs, uh, health, uh, social, uh, and safety and security. Uh, as an example, one of these uh, services uh, called Mom and Baby uh, gives uh, to our customers and specifically to women uh, free access uh, to learn about uh, pregnancy and uh, your baby's health. Uh, the Connect You access uh, is for free, so it's really only a matter of allowing these customers uh, to get uh, a 4G smartphone uh, or feature phone uh, and give to them uh, a proper digital education. Uh, to achieve that, uh, we have uh, several uh, digital education programs ongoing, addressing specifically kids, schools, disadvantaged communities, and women. Such programs also help to address the uh, willingness to pay versus uh, ability to pay dichotomy presented uh, in the report, as uh, prospect customers can clearly see the greater value of owning uh, a 4G handset. To, um, to conclude, uh, Vodafone inclusion for all strategy 
uh, allowed us to already achieve uh, at the Vodafone group level in the past month, uh, our uh, 2025 target uh, to connect uh, 20 million uh, additional women uh, to mobile uh, in, uh, in our African markets uh, and in Turkey. So uh, the strategy is working on one end, uh, and on the other end, uh, uh, we are defining uh, a new challenging uh, target. Great, thanks, and congratulations on reaching, uh, reaching that target, and also that you're great to hear you're setting a new one, and uh, very interesting to hear about how you're you're looking at both willingness to pay and um, and the affordability ability to pay. So that's very interesting examples. Um, I'm going to go back to you, Sebastian. I don't know if you have any reaction to anything Davide said about, for example, um, supply chains being optimized, et cetera. Or, but I'd also love to hear uh, from you about, you know, you mentioned you were prioritizing low income, but you know, um, you know, you know, where who are you prioritizing specifically for your efforts, and and how is that impacting on your strategy? Yeah, yes. Okay, maybe a quick reaction on the cost uh, on the supply chain. Yes, I, I fully agree with the comment with, from Davide. Uh, actually, the COVID, uh, the impact of COVID uh, and the price, the, the, the shortage on semiconductors, the price on, on chipsets actually impacted the price and increased the price of most of the mobile device in the past years. We see that coming back a little bit, but uh, still we, we, we will be on a plateau. I, I don't believe we that there will be a very a, any uh, drastic change on the cost of low-end uh, or most affordable uh, devices. Now, now uh, to, to, to answer and to give some, some different uh, perspective also on the on the uh, let's say the, the uh, on your question, um, we we see um, Distribution of 2G phones is mostly today going through uh, informal channels and uh, informal merchants. And the, the operator don't sell 2G phone for years already. And they, so most of the distribution of this phone is actually going um, through, uh, through informal merchants and through, through, uh, through non-carrier control channels. And so at KOS, we, we um, we want to provide an uh, alternative to these 2G phones which are in the market. So we we have a, a different approach, and this program is not completely launched yet. We, we are going to, to launch uh, starting this year, but we want to bring phone into these informal channels with 4G capability, but um, with some form of subsidies that bring them down to the price of 2G or close to the price of 2G. Um, so so we, th this is very important in our, our strategy. and. Um, especially if you think about rural uh, uh, population, um, because the access to the phone um, through these infor informal uh, channels and informal market is, is the main uh, uh, way for, for, for people to buy, uh, to buy phones today. Um, so, so, so this is one, one aspect. The second aspect, which we would like to develop and um, uh, we want to engage more with, uh, with government, is to create more usefulness into the device and to make sure that some of the government services, some maybe also some agency services can be available on all the devices, uh, including the lowest um, segment. And so, so we, we will be happy and we, we are looking for this cooperation with government agency uh, to make available more applications onto the entry uh, device uh, through web. Uh, the, the last point, and this is, this is uh, uh, an effort we did in our side to give more content. Um, we have an application in Kai uh, OS, in all the Kai OS devices, which is Kai Life, which actually give access to uh, financial education, to uh, any type of education content, uh, health uh, content, gender equality, and so on, from big partners. So most of them being the, the UN agencies. Uh, so we get vetted uh, content available uh, for people to, to 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 access. So so I, uh, yes, these, these are the three points I wanted to uh, to list. Thanks. It's really interesting to hear that both of you are not just a, you know looking at this content side and how you can add value, um, not just in terms of affordability. Very interesting. Um, so I think um, we're starting to come in time for this panel. But so I just wanted to ask. I mean, I'll start with you, Sebastian. You know. We just know that handset affordability is such a big barrier to digital inclusion, and um, it really needs to be prioritized if we're going to not ensure people aren't being left behind. And we, we heard from Debbie Day about, for example, the Broadband Commission is now tackling it. Lots of people are trying to tackle it. Um, 
So if you had one final piece of advice to give for those who are trying to address this issue, if, you know, we've talked about lots of things, you've had lots of strategies, what would your, you know, what would your final piece of advice be for those working on this? Yeah, maybe I'd, I'd like to, to, uh, to list, uh, maybe not just one. Yeah, that's fine, things. go ahead. <laughs> so so first, first I, I believe that there are funds and there are, <clears throat> when, we, when we look at the, the efforts that have been done around the, 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 the access to broadband, broadband network, a lot of investment have been done. Um, it's probably time to shift part of the investment done on the, the network to the handset affordability. Um, there's a lot of DFI and a lot of funds available, and I, I, I believe it's a, it's a good switch, a good time to, to switch efforts and to, to make really handset affordable. So this is this is from funding perspective, and also this includes uh, uh, the uni universal service fund, which could probably used uh, be used more for the onset affordability now. Uh, the second aspect is the import tax, and we've talked about, about that. Um, in many cases, we see countries trying to maybe increase the import tax to develop the local manufacturing or local assembly. What we observe is very often it actually increases the price of the onset at the end. It's not decreasing the price of the onset. Um, the, the third aspect is the, uh, the device financing. There's a lot of uh, fintech, um, but most of the fintech are today focused on the middle class. And so uh, extending loans from $1,000 to, uh, from $100 to $1,000, um, we need nano financing. So this is really important. We need small financing to start because, as we said, this customer don't have a credit rating. And by extending a first $10, you start to build the credit rating and then you are able to grow people. So, so this, I believe, is important also. And then the last point is creating usefulness. So uh, making services available even on the lowest uh, price uh, product is very important. And the government uh, can help us in that. Oh, thank you. So, very interesting. Um, Davide, I'll go for you for the final word. First of all, if you have any reaction to anything that Sebastian said, but also what would your piece of advice be for those trying to tackle this issue? No, well, uh, I um, I agree with uh, uh, with uh, Sebastian's view in terms of uh, segment target uh, and the need for uh, uh, for uh, uh, affordable loans. Um, on top of traditional subsidized offer, I believe that financing schemes uh, and affordable loans uh, could play a, a big role uh, in the future to increase uh, digital inclusion. Um, as I said, in Kenya, we have more uh, than half a million active customers paying uh, 4G smartphones by installment. Uh, other opportunities, uh, as mentioned uh, also by Sebastian, uh, sits in the regulatory government space uh, uh, multilaterals uh, and over-the-top uh, support, uh, as well as uh, in uh, pre-owned devices, uh, uh, the opportunity uh, which we are exploring together with uh, the ITU and the uh, United uh, uh, Nations. Uh, more in general, uh, I believe uh, the digital divide issue is uh, so complex uh, that uh, the single actors of the value chain uh, will not be able to solve it uh, uh, alone. Uh, governments, uh, operators, uh, over the tops, uh, multilaterals, uh, uh, manufacturers, uh, uh, no one uh, uh, will be able to achieve uh, digital inclusion alone. Uh, I strongly believe uh, uh, that uh, what is needed uh, is the whole value chain and industry commitment uh, and, and effort. The whole industry must uh, mobilize uh, and cooperate uh, to achieve uh, uh, inclusion for all, uh, and, and at the end, uh, a fully, fully connected uh, uh, society. Great. Thanks. That's a strong call to action. We all need to work on this and tackle it. Um, I just want to thank you both so much for your time today. And it's been fascinating to hear what you have to say. And I'm really looking forward to following your, your efforts as you try and tackle this moving forward as well. So thank you so much for your time. And uh, I guess, Isabel, it's back to you. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Davide and Sebastian, for sharing your insights on how we can make handsets more affordable. It really resonates with our report, too, that this is not something that can be solved by a single institution, that we all need to work together. 
I want to also extend a big thanks to all the experts who contributed to shaping this report on making internet enabled handsets more affordable. A special thank you to Encopa that worked with us on a case study around their pay as you go model in Africa that Davide also mentioned too on handset financing. And in this time of economic turmoil, there really is no single approach that can make handsets more affordable for underserved populations. So it will take considerable efforts, as Davide said for us at the end, and those partnerships between the different sectors and different strategies, those three strategies together, as Sebastian also said, that we need all of those three together, making handsets um, lower cost, making financing available and using those policy levers to reach um, low income populations. So let's take away what we've learned today, um, work together and make internet enabled handsets more affordable, connecting everyone to everything for a better future. Thank you all for listening today. Please do download our report um, and thank you for your time.